What did people do 100 years ago to predict the weather and climate before they went to meteorology class? Or they didn't have such a thing in college. What did the farmers do? They didn't have radar. They didn't have the drones monitoring the fields. So what did they do before we had any technology? They did something that was actually quite accurate. Even more accurate than technology today. Our grandparents thought to themselves, when was the last time something like this happened? So, for example, in the United States, we had a big drought that affected much of the US in the 1950s, around 1955. So the farmers said, when did I see this? I saw this in the 1930s. It happened just like this in 1936. And then the drought patterns were repeating themselves roughly every 11 years or so. So you know what the farmers were doing? They were analyzing patterns in their mind and thinking back when they saw something similar. And when they saw something similar, what would it mean would happen into the future? So they were using historical information to provide the basis of future information. And that is the bedrock and the foundation of what we now call data mining. Data mining. Where even Google uses it. But intuitively, people have been doing this for centuries. But now we have computers that can analyze millions of data points from historical information and give you the future likelihood of things happening. And that technology is called data mining. And if you have a system that continues to input what is happening and continues to use history to predict the future, that is called artificial intelligence. That is called machine learning. Because it used to be the farmers would learn it in their own minds, what would happen over time, and use it to predict the future. Now who is learning it? The computer is learning it. So that's why it's called machine learning. But it used to be farmer learning. <laughs> it used to be human learning and that we would learn from the past and use those patterns for the future. So, this terminology that we speak nowadays is actually something that we have been doing as human beings for many, many years, but now we have the computer that can do it on a very large scale with a lot of information and a lot of data in a very precise and a very mathematical way. So all of this machine learning and all of this stuff is what I just explained to you. So I'm kind of explaining it, and then you see the very complicated slide. Otherwise, you see the complicated slide, and you say, I don't understand that. <laughs> but I'm showing it to you after, because now you actually know everything that's in this slide. So and there are a lot of benefits when the computer is learning from historical data. You know, nothing in this life can be predicted 100% accurately. Can you predict anything, the future 100% accurately? No, nothing. So anytime you deal with a prediction or a forecast, you're always dealing with a probability, with a likelihood of something happening, and a range of values. So with my endeavors, 
we want to be more sure, have a greater likelihood, and lessen the range of error. So we are chasing accurate, accuracy. It's like a, a chasing. That's what we're trying to do. And that's why we were rated as number one is because we have the shortest error at the longest range and with the highest probability of accuracy. So it's, it's a purely a statistics game. So I think, and I am very partial, but I think in these techno technology fields, in these scientific fields, the study of statistics and the understanding of uncertainty is of great importance in science and in innovation because it is a game of probability. Anytime we're trying to predict something, which is what we're always trying to do in science and technology. So let's talk about the Philippines. What's going on climate-wise? So in the U.S., there are a lot of people who are wrangling about what is causing the climate change. Some people say it's all the big oil and gas people and all of these emissions. Other people say it's natural causes and this and this and this. But whatever is causing it, we know experientially that our patterns are becoming more intensified, yeah? And Dr. Glenn Bonacos and I were speaking that we're seeing more and more super typhoons. And we're seeing them come into areas that we haven't seen them come into before, like here. And that's why we're here. Because the climate change means that climate is becoming more extreme and intense. And it's not just a short-term thing. So let me explain something to you. Even if the entire world went 100% over to renewables, and we completely shut down all fossil fuel consumption today. There is enough residue and enough that is already in motion in the climate that we are going to see these intensified climate extremes and disasters for many more decades into the future. So I'm talking minimum of 30 years, and even into the 50 to 60 year horizon, if we went completely over to renewables. That's what all of the models are showing. So the question is, how good are these models? How on earth can we predict 30 and 50 years into the future? And so that is a really great modeling question. And so we're back at the dawn of when we were doing climate modeling, I was a young intern at Lawrence Livermore National Labs, and we were doing early climate models. And we were seeing in our models back in the year 1990, that's 30, about 30 years ago, that come 2015 or so, we were seeing a lot of ramp up and a lot of different things happening in the atmosphere in our climate models. Little did I know that down the road, you don't think when you're, you know, in university that you would, well, where you would be 30 years from now, and that I would be a climate scientist and actually looking at those old models and seeing if it came to pass. And it's really, really eerie. It's eerie that when I look back at the models we were doing in the government labs back then, all, I would say everything major that had been predicted actually came to pass to the year. 
to the year. I don't know why that is, honestly. <laughs> it was, these models were primitive. And we didn't include a lot of things because we didn't have knowledge, or whatever, whatever. But we were modeling just the major things that we were seeing and putting them in the most early of the Cray supercomputers. When it was experimental. But what's happened is that models, there are, there are a lot of models that have actually been very accurate in predicting the climate and have verified very, very well. So this is what we have. And what it is suggesting is that we have to do something about it in terms of adapting to what's happening. You know, Miami, Miami, which is where I do a lot of work in the US, should be completely underwater. Right now. Did you know that? Did you know all of South Florida should not even exist right now? It should be completely underwater. So why is it not completely underwater? It's because they took certain adaptation strategies. They built higher, they built drainage systems, they built dams, they did all of these kinds of things to kind of get the water out of the land into the ocean and adapt to sea level rise and extreme rain and all this, and we have a piece of the United States that we should never have had ordinarily. So it's very interesting, and, and what we're seeing in research is that in 30 years, entire islands in the Philippines should be non-existent. It's the truth. It's what we're seeing. And so this is why we're doing this work and why it's important now to do this type of adaptation because we're really saving our communities. So in the Philippines, we're seeing this climate change and we're seeing where typhoons were more further north affecting more southern areas such as Mindanao. So this is why we're here. And you know, I don't know, I don't know how many people know this here in the Philippines. I know you're Filipino, but the Philippines is always year upon year in the top three countries in the world most extreme when it comes to climate and disaster impacts. In the whole world, we usually switch places with Bangladesh or Indonesia or Vietnam, but we are, but in 2015, it was the number one. And year upon year, it actually had, the Philippines has the number one highest incidence of climate disasters than any other country on the planet Earth. This is the worst. It's, a, in my opinion, the most beautiful <laughs> country, but our beauty here is what might make us the worst also because a lot of our beauty is due to a lot of coastal areas, a lot of islands and beaches and all of this, which are also danger zones, right? With storm surges and cold. But it's what, you know, it's what creates also all the biodiversity and all the great things that we have here. So, you know, it's, it's something that we have to just take into consideration why my work is focused here in the Philippines. So I wanted to just share with you, okay, so yes, we can predict things using data mining, yes. <laughs> so before I get into this, I want to talk about typhoons. I want to talk about typhoons. So what can we do? There is, I want to tell you, let me tell you just a little story. I'm actually almost to the end of my presentation. I actually only have about one more slide. So let me tell you a story. <laughs> I think I have time for a little story. When I was at the University of Cambridge, that's where I did my graduate work, I was there in 1994. <laughs> and I studied under a professor who was trained in Moscow. He was a very old professor. You know, he was in his 70s back then. He's in his 90s now. And back then, and this is before, you know, all the big computers and everything, they were doing research at the University of Cambridge, and then later they continued the research at the U 
University of California in Berkeley and with a team from Moscow, it was, you know, this international research. This was before computers, okay, before computers. It was just mathematical calculations on paper. And they found in the equations that govern typhoons that there is a way, mathematically, to get rid of typhoons. How do you get rid of a typhoon? And what they found is that mathematically, okay, what is it that is causing the typhoon to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and become super tight? And they found that you have the ocean surface and you have this emerging storm system. And what's happening is on the ocean, from the ocean surface, there is spray, ocean spray that is coming up from the ocean and it's going into the storm system and fueling it like the petrol or gasoline going into your vehicle that's fueling it. And it's this spray, and they call it the sandwich model, the light fuel sandwich model. It's the spray that is feeding it. So they found how do you cut down on the spray? And sailors, in the 1800s, they found many, many papers that sailors in the 1800s would take oil on their ships. And when a storm would come, they would throw the oil overboard. And what it would do when they put the oil overboard is it would actually create a surface tension on the water such that there would be no spray to come up and it would stop the storm around their ships, wherever the oil was. They were using whale oil, and all kinds of oil. But, so, my professor said to me, and it was very prophetic, and I was talking to him about 10 years ago, and said to me, Rhea, someday you are going to stop a typhoon. And I'm thinking, this is crazy. I have no means to do this. <laughs> but something very revolutionary happened in the last year. Revolutionary. The University of Miami in Florida built a $45 million, US dollars, $45 million building. And you know what this building is? It's a giant fish tank. It's a giant tank filled with water. And do you know what they're doing in there? They are creating man-made typhoons. Huge wind tunnel. And they run it through this absolutely humongous building. And they're creating typhoons in a laboratory. That is the size of this university. And so now that we can create typhoons in the lab, we can test all of these theories. And I am now the head of the research efforts at this lab. What my professor told me <laughs> decades ago has turned out to be true. So, in June, we conducted a very big experiment where we created, at the University of Miami, Category 1 typhoon, Category 2, Category 3, Category 4. We went through and we created all kinds of typhoons in this building. And we took the seawater because the laboratory is right on the coast. So we, we feed in the seawater through pipes. It's filled with actual seawater. It's, I have all kinds of big, it's the most amazing thing to see before your eyes in this huge building an actual typhoon being created before your eyes with a wind tunnel. And to see the dynamics. And what we found this past 
June is that everything that this research group found that I was telling you decades ago, before computers, was 100% the truth. It is the ocean spray, and if you put, and now what we found, so I found microbiologists and some chemists and some people who have developed for me a substance which is a fish food. It is a plant oil that is biodegradable, organic, safe for marine life. I have research team they developed this so that we don't have to use whale oil and these kinds of things on the water surface. And how much of this substance do we need to put on the water? It actually works at a, at a molecular level. The layer only needs to be a molecule's depth. That means in this entire hurricane facility in Miami, you know how much of that oil we use? One liter. We, we built an apparatus at the University of Miami that could spray an atomic layer on the surface, one liter of the substance put on the surface. And the ocean spray would stay down, and the typhoon could not intensify. Did you hear what I said? It's interesting, right? And we took all kinds of videos and footage. We had all kinds of ultraviolet uh, camera, you know, I mean, they have the whole setup with all the graduate students and the Department of Marine and Atmospheric Science and all the professors and everybody on, on my team. They were so wonderful in conducting all of these experiments. And so now we know that the thing works in the lab. What do we do now? Well, let's do it in the ocean. So we're going to do it here in Mindanao. When we get the next super typhoon come through, we're going to put our fish food and see what happens. And we're going to take the observations and see if we can stop at least a portion of it dead in its tracks. It's simple in a way. It, it really is. But it's a really interesting way how you see over the years the convergence of academia and the scientists and what they were finding, and then the development of computers, and then the development of this research laboratory, and then bringing it now up into the humanitarian sector to actually do this and see if we can save billions of lives, starting with the Philippines. So that is one of the projects that I'm involved with. I just wanted to share with you. <laughs> on a mitigation type of project. So it sounds really wild, you know, like you say, it's like science fiction, but really, it's the real thing, I'm telling you. <laughs> so, I just have a few keys to innovation, you know. My key, these are my keys. My keys are setting goals. Anytime you want to innovate something, you gotta want to know what do I want to do? What do I want to innovate? What am I passionate about? And set that goal and be really, really focused. All my life and all the things that I've done, it's like, Rhea, how did you accomplish these things? Because I, and the way we accomplish anything is to be goal-oriented and to focus very hard and very passionately on it. And even when there are obstacles, you still have that goal. And for me, it's just a personal commentary. For me, maybe you are different. For me, my faith plays a huge role in it. I believe in God. And so when I have a goal, and even when obstacles come through, I pray, I believe in God to go over this obstacle. My whole life is faith days. I can't do anything without that. And so that, for me, is how I accomplish out-of-the-box thinking. So it's okay to think kind of crazy, 
because I think all things are possible. That's how I think. And collaboration. We're not in a vacuum. In all that I do, I have this team, and we have that team, and this partnership, and that collab. Because all of us are working together to accomplish these things. Albert Einstein said that it was the gift of his imagination that meant the most to him in all of his scientific endeavors. And imagination is actually not a left brain thing. It's actually a right brain. It's a creative, intuitive thing, artistic. And that was his biggest gift, was imagination. So imagine, that's a great God-given facility that we have to use our imagination. And a mathematician said it's through science that we prove, but it's through intuition that we discover. So it's very important, very important. Interdisciplinary approach and collaboration, and you've seen that in what I'm talking about here. Mathematics with computer science, with physics, with media, all these things, risk science, all these things coming together to produce great quantum leaps in discovery and innovation. And this is my last slide, which is the climate solutions ecosystem. What does it mean? The first thing in climate solutions, or I think it, this applies to many technologies, you need good data. From the data, good predictions. From the predictions, what are the impacts upon our human life with those predictions? From the impact planning, then figure out what do I need to do to plan to mitigate the impacts. Once you have a plan, where am I going to get the money to finance those plans? Once you have the money, you're going to implement your plan. And from implementation is where we get our policy, our communications, our training, and our advocacy. And this is this ecosystem that I like to call it. So we started with the data and what it's teaching us into the risks, the impacts, the plans, the financing, the implementation, and then we go into our policy, our communication, and our training programs. So these are all of these significant climate anomalies that have happened all over the world in 2017. You can't read all the little bubbles. All you can see is that there's a whole lot of them. <laughs> kind of unprecedented climate activity really interesting. But I just want to thank you all very much for this opportunity to share. I hope it was interesting for you. And I love the people of Mindanao. So thankful to be here. God bless you all. Thank you so much, Ms. Ria, for that revealing, informative presentation on stack weather technology application for weather forecasting. Just a piece of reminder to presenters, we're only given 10 minutes presentation for discussion, five minutes only, and for the open forum, 20 minutes only. For the audience, you are invited to ask questions. In a piece of paper, you just write the question and the name of the speaker whom you wish to answer the question. And another reminder also, we have a timer there, speakers, discussions. Please, let's be conscious with time. Thank you. Our second speaker this afternoon is the faculty of the Electronics Engineering Department of this university. And he is the current director of Innovation and Technology Solutions Division. His achievements include as a professional <laughs> electronics engineer, Outstanding Electronics Engineer of the Philippines in 2015, Certified Structured Cabling Professional, Certified Fiber Optics Specialist, and Member of Building Industry Consulting Service International. He is sharing to us his research output titled Design and Development of Management Information System for Smart Agriculture an integrated ICT-based platform introducing smart farming in Region 10. 
Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together to Engineer Alex L. Mario. Okay, kaya na, nabuo yung project ng Misa. 
uh, management information system for smart control. This is the introduction talaga ng industry 4.0. Kasi kung wala ng data, wala eh. Di ba? Walang, walang use yung technology. So, the purpose is, the overall objective of the research is to establish an integrated ICT-based platform to improve agricultural production and marketing of agri-based products in Region 10. So, we want to design and uh, develop an application package that can send relevant information in telemetry, right, from the farm, the farmers. And we want also to design and design uh, equipment for soil testing and analysis to improve nutrient management and farming communities in the region. Ito yung purpose namin. We want to contribute something. We start from the information. We want to gather information. And this is our, our framework. We have this, our portal, database. We want to develop uh, an application for compiling uh, farmer or uh, farm. We want to help the Bulwa, Bulwa Vegetable Landing Area. That's the producer, that's the trading center that sends products from Bukidon and Bukidon to Manila. Okay? We want them to monitor, we work with Norman Beaches, the association of the growers and traders for vegetables. And we want also to develop a soil sensing system. Uh, somehow this will complete, the data will be gathered here and uh, eventually it can uh, help the farmers to have uh, a right decision on when to and what to, to plan. Okay, so we have two uh, four components here. So fertility, farm profiling, mobile application, trading station agri-products, visa portal. We just want to try. We want to develop and then so we Let's try. We presented this to the city agriculture in Kegel Europe and we submitted for the next year's funding. Kasi wala nang funding eh. This is just for the love of helping how to help our region in terms of food security. Okay, so the soil sensing fertility device, uh, this is the first version. This is an um, RAS verified based uh, device wherein ang strategy na nun, because we already help City of Kegel Europe in in streamlining the permitting or building permits uh, way back 2014. And we have a, a hard time dealing with people in the, in the government. And you know how good your system is, but if the person that processes your application don't know how to use the mouse, then the conclusion is it's not good. The system is not good. So we incorporated uh, what we call the change management, how we manage change. So we talked to the, how the, the, what's the process in gaining data from the, from the farm or from the farmers. And they told us that we have uh, farm technicians, but it's, it's now under the local government unit. So they, they have this kit, this kit, we have that one, is the the soil test kit, so what we did is just not a purely 100% automation. What we did is, because according to one of the officials, the farm technician somewhere in Quito can just write the data, copy the other data, or just just a copy of the data that gathered before, and then send it by a mail. So it takes around two months to collect the data that support the soil fertility data. So what we did is, The STK, so test kit, so color coding, right? By having this equipment or as very by base, just put the the soil or the sample with the chemicals, and then automatically it will it will uh, determine the NPK, the value as 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 well as the pH value, okay? And then it will send it to the portal, okay? So. Pag send to the portal, identify this is the kit, and this is our, our second version in this one. What's the difference? The difference is that we found out that using the color sensor, there are a lot of uh, uh, data 
the problems along the way, it's because using we are using phone or sensor. But the other one is we develop an algorithm wherein um, medyo kundi na lang yung, yung error. Okay? Until such time, this is our uh, test for the color sensing. We validate our testing with the DA. We, we, we submitted the soil sample to the laboratory and compared the testing. Okay? So this is our algorithm to determine the pH at its level of the soil. And then uh, we successfully uploaded data from our device. You can store, you can store it. Uh, it has the storage. Then later on, you can also uh, send it if you have an internet connection. The newer version that we are working with this now is smaller one and back. And we are working with ETC and uh, probably partner with Telco. How to utilize the new 2G network? Diba? We already have 3G, 4G. Ang 2G kasi na network facilities nandun lang sa, sa mga tower. Walang use. So probably we'll be, uh, we, we already have some few meetings with them. How to utilize the 2G network to send data in the remote area? Okay? So ngayon, ano, uh, run by data, internet. Kailangan ng internet. Okay, so this is our mobile app for profiling of farmers and farm. So it can send the data to the uh, portal. Another one application is the trading stations and the products, mobile apps. We want in the Bulwa vegetable nutting area to track all the products that they send to other areas like in Manila. So that may QR code na na sticker na dun sa kahon. And if you want, if you are a consumer in Manila, and if you want to know the details on the farmers and the farm, you can have it uh, read on the QR code if you have a QR code reader. Then alam mo kung sino yung farmers at yung gali. Our purpose is para ano ba, na meron 5 star. Para ang rating. Rating na ano, na mga na mga consumer. So eventually, yun ang target natin. Dapat may tracking tayo. Okay, may problema pala itong product na ito. We don't want to buy it from the other area. So nakatrack siya. Lahat na ipapadala ng bagayang lukuro, vegetable na ng area to Manila, natrack na siya. Okay? Well, this is also a very high case. Uh, ito yung setup niya. Doon sa, sa trading center, may internet connection, tapos nagpapadala doon sa Visa server natin. Okay? So ito yung mga data. Ito yung printout ng ano, ng your code, okay? So this is the working prototype. And this is the detail sum, scan details, okay? So lahat ng information from the from the soil fertility sensing device, from the Android application, farm profiling, and also yung sa uh, trading stations na tracking and monitoring. Dito pumunta sa Visa portal natin, okay? So, this is the concept. Nakukuha na yung mga data, all the, the data that you want to store and eventually we want to improve uh, magkaroon tayo ng graph for mapping, no? For the vegetables and uh, if you want to scroll down the, the mouse, then you will know sino ang, kanino ang, sino ang owner ng farm, yung size ng farm at saka yung volume ng harvest at that particular moment. So we want the farmers to know, okay, may nagtanit pala ng maraming kamatis ngayon in three months time ng harvest. I don't want to plant it now. I can plant it later. So, if that information is available to farmers, we can help them in a way that para meron ng planning din ng, 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 ng planting. And also we want to track down the harvest rate. Okay? So this is what, what we did in our uh, project because I only have 10 minutes. So we want to implement this project. Nagkaroon na kami ng prototype. We will be having the third version na mas maliit na. At saka mas uh, accurate na that it's 2G enabled na. Kasi may mga ideas na wala 3G, wala data. Okay? Pag 2G enabled, meaning is a test. 
they can set the date at 5x. Okay? So, we want to have not to delete the value of rho, probably it will do it, and probably it will do it now, if we can try to test this system. Thank you and Professor of Computer Engineering at University of Science and Technology of Southern Philippines or USDP. She earned her Master of Science in Computer Applications in June 2018 at Mindanao State University Iligan Institute of Technology and was accorded best thesis. To share to us her research output titled Prototype Implementation of Emergency Communication System for a small scale fishing boat is Miss Miriam A. Pitias. A round of applause, please. Weather is very unstable when it comes to typhoons and it can only 
is changed in the constant. So in the Philippine Coast Guard official website, as what you can see there, reports of uh, missing fishermen are always updated every month. So there are a lot of, uh, some of them are never reported or not reported even because of lack of data. So with this mobile signal, which is unstable or lost when it comes to sea, plus expensive distress communication devices, and a no location of fishermen, if ever there is a survivor that has reported, there would also be unreliable or lack of information sources. So delayed, when it comes to searching NIP, it's very delayed because um, the la last known location is not known. And rescue operations are very costly and time consuming. That's why if there is no progress, the operation can stop. So this provides no closure with the family and um, has a devastating impact on the community and the family that is got behind. So with the limitation at sea, this study, a prototype implementation of emergency communication system for small scale fishing boat is implemented. So how does, what is the main objective of this study? So to design and develop an onboard device that can send emergency signal to the base station and receive warning signal from the base station in case there are sudden weather updates that the fisherman doesn't know. And um, to design and develop an application software using GPS that can track the vessel's current location and traverse um, also the path of the boat using the mesh network. So how does it work? This is the architecture. So we have a base station with an RF technology here and it's a mapping software. It is also implemented and we have a signal extender which is located in the floating voice experimental and we have nodes that were created and those devices were planted in the uh, boats and it confuses its own GPS module that is not dependent on signal on your mobile phone. Because most games, most of the fishermen, they don't have actually mobile phones or Android. So this continuous stream of signal to the bantai data providing immediate assistance in rescue operation. So with this technology, it provides faster tracking of the missing fishermen by providing the exact nearest location during search operation. So this can record from the very beginning of the track of the fishermen until the last signal that was received from the boat. So it provides closure to the family just in case bodies are recovered. And with this monitoring system also, this is um, a cheaper version for the Bantai data to be used. This will enable them to use the data and to have it to the rightful authorities to take proper action in any emergency situation. So these are the important notes. We have location determination and distress message communication and reporting when there is a sudden weather alert system. So the coordinate mapper is tested in Barangay Agusa, Tirea, Moro City. So the aerial map is screenshot. Uh, it uses a letter mapper coordinate because in the city there is no such as like Google map that there is a way where to go. So this saves data and the coordinates and this also shows the track path of each boat and the maximum distances traveled. So the tested RF here is uh, within 15 kilometers of site. So this is uh, the hardware integration and these are the main concepts of the system to locate first the base station, to wait for transmission, to plot the coordinates, forward sign signals and then receive. So this is the map that was, uh, this is the software that was created. So it shows the aerial map and the current location of the boats. And it can also show the, uh, it can send first signals. And also we have here um, show uh, the latest or the traverse path of the fishermen. So when you send an emergency warning for fishermen, it receives the distress signal and it provides real-time monitor of connected boats. It hosts also a storage and retrieval for last known location of disconnected boats. So this is the hardware prototype that was implemented with antennas. So this can be connected in a mobile phone or a standalone battery. And these are the boat tests. So this were done, uh, this were put in a pool and a bubble pool. And upon deployment, this is also uh, the house of the Bandai Nagapar Sudan in Agusan, where 
we tested our base station location. So this is the result um, from uh, one vote and then another vote that currently tracks the current uh, distance and the location to where the vote is. And with that, um, the grid is uh, um, changing and also if you can see there that the other vote is still unsure and the other is at sea. Uh, these are the reports in the system. And we have here, so this is the mapping already. So this is the optimum distance that we're tested already. And uh, at 5 kilometers, because the RF use was, we did 8 kilometers. And this is the track path that was analyzed uh, uh, for the both data that uh, was tested. So that is for the one vote and then the another for the second vote. And uh, with this software also, it can also show both the path and also the maximum distance traveled by the fishermen. So this is a validation of data from the GPS visualizer and offline um, and GPS analyzer. And these are some computations that were used to verify the data. So this can also send broadcast message from the base station. And this is also just a proof that the abut message at certain point. So these are some of the reports generated for this system. So with these devices, we can it has been able to successfully transmit and receive emergency communication. Also, the coordinate mapper was able to pinpoint the exact location of the measurements scope. So using these devices, this will add another layer of communication and improvements in disaster, especially for our local fishermen. So the efficiency of this development of the forest communication is efficient enough for this time, since it's under development, at the point of connection within line of sight. So for further development, actually this study can be branched out in many terms. So in possible after disaster management, and this can also help map if a certain location is congested by this certain lo uh, local fishermen. One problem that was encountered is that um, when a fisherman goes, he actually do not know if that certain location has a lack of fish or not. So it's a point of trial and error. And this can also add a monetary boundaries because at the moment the problem for commercial fishing that goes within municipal fishing. See. So that's all. Thank you very much. Speaker for the second session is Dr. Elmer Dadios, Professor of Manufacturing, Engineering, and Management Department of the La Salle University. He has been introduced this morning, so no need to introduce him further. Thank you, sir.
Tama yung ano? Uh, drivers have no discipline, 
and so this uh, uh, makes it very difficult to control. So what we propose uh, uh, is uh, uh, doing something, uh, a software-based, uh, a machine learning-based uh, system uh, using a camera uh, to apprehend and uh, uh, violators. So uh, specifically, CATSO is a vision-based system that incorporates artificial intelligence, algorithm used for vehicle detection. Uh, we can track also the motion of the vehicle. We can identify the vehicle, and uh, we can uh, identify, uh, we can judge the traffic violation of that vehicle. So the components of this is uh, we have a video capture system, and of course the software which is uh, an analytics, uh, data analytics. But in this case, this is a video analytics. So uh, an output system which is a traffic violation database, and an outdoor LED screen notification system. So this is the architecture, uh, the hardware, of course, the camera, and then of course our software, the, uh, the uh, vision system analysis. Now in the vision system, we have to do digital signal processing, uh, digital image processing. So the output is car profile, plate numbers, uh, validation, and of course the proof of the violations. So that, that is the hardware. And uh, this is a sample uh, video captured by a camera. Uh, this is in front of the sun. So this is uh, the the uh, uh, TV that will display uh, the violators. Uh, this is the one that will be displayed. Uh, your plate number uh, is shown also, and uh, you will be warned that you violated number code. So now I mentioned to you this is now a product. So uh, this is uh, uh, commercially available, and so uh, our system we call it software as a service. So it includes customizable features such as vehicle detection and counting system, vehicle classification system, license plate detection and optical character recognition system, and of course the number coding and detection system. And uh, we have the interface user interface application. And the most important part here is the reports generation. So this is, includes the evidence that a person really violated the traffic rule. Now, the SAS has uh, this uh, raw video data, or the video is uh, stored, and then we can analyze that video. It can be analyzed offline, and then it can have automated database encoding, and then video evidence storage and retrieval system. And so we can have incidents report, summary reports, and tracking reports. So this is the sample uh, of the product. Uh, you can see on the screen, you can, uh, our camera can, can detect, and then it can display uh, this one. And then, of course, it can uh, enhance the plate number from this. Uh, it can enhance the plate number here and then give uh, appropriate uh, actions also. Okay, so the console uh, report system is similar to this. Uh, you have the validations. Uh, okay. So this is a sample of a real system. This is in its virtual uh, zone. Uh, it's a live feed. Uh, automatically our camera capture that our system can uh, pinpoint where our numbers of the car and then uh, these are uh, processed because normally the plate numbers have different uh, alphabets that's the sad thing in our plate numbers uh, we have different kinds of plate numbers unlike abroad we have a uniform plate numbers so in our case we need to process that thoroughly and so um, you can see this side here is the one that already processed from here. So you can look at the plate numbers and put it here. And uh, you can see the difference uh, from this one, which is difficult to identify. Our system can identify it totally. So even the profiling of cars, we can do that, as I mentioned. Even the counting, we can do that. If you need more information on this, we have a brochure for this. So, um, 
I can give you that. And then, of course, the uh, product that we developed, uh, I mentioned that uh, we developed uh, a machine for filming. Uh, this one is uh, for Mingo. We're using computer vision and the uh, machine learning to identify the defects of the Mingo. So uh, this is, of course, uh, uh, the, the architecture of that. And not only Mango, but also quality of the fish. As an example, uh, we have a tuna fish here. We can we can identify the quality of that. We have a camera here from the conveying system, and then we can have the pins uh, where these fish are uh, put properly. Uh, we can do it by quality, or we can do it by size or weight. Uh, so that's the idea here. And uh, there, these are the pins that this. Uh, Tuna fish can be put in. Uh, so with the mango also, uh, we need to rotate the mango and uh, our camera is here looking at this mango here. It is rotating because it's important that the whole portion of the mango can be, uh, should be scanned uh, for the facts. So it's like this. Uh, we have a good quality data set and good uh, reject quality data. So we can make adjustment. Uh, if you say that uh, your client not needs a 5% effect or 10% effect or 15% effect or 20% and so on, we can do that. The beauty of the system is this is adaptable to the needs of the client. And so uh, another thing is I have this product also with the uh, Stripe, I mentioned to you, we are supported by the USA and uh, we have a project on uh, automation of cocoa sugar production. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, for us here in Mindanao, we have lots of coconuts and we're using only the cocoa sap for tuba. Sino ba ang kalap dito ng to? May no parang ba kayo ng tuba? Okay? Uh, you can make sugar out of that. What is important is you harvest it uh, before six hours of chopping. It means that you need to uh, to uh, be aware of the time because the pH content of that is still sugar. I mean, the, the, the chemical content of that is still sugar. Remember, if, uh, if the cocoa sap still uh, early stage, it, it's so sweet. And then later, it's lalabas ng alcohol. Okay. So in this case, uh, this is very famous now in the market, cocoa sugar. It means maybe 350 a kilo compared to uh, local sugar cane, which is 50 to 60. So this is high value. And in fact, uh, these are imported. Uh, we export this right away. So I'm lucky I was uh, supported by the USA. So the impact of the product is uh, increased production and quality control of the coconut sugar open business opportunity and livelihood to the coconut farmers. Uh, in this case, we have a partner uh, cooperative in Ragai, Bicol. Bicol is known for coconut industry also. And so, uh, the, the uh, benefactor of our project is the cooperative in Ragai. This is the local farmers in Ragai, Bicol. And uh, to develop the cocoa sugar at that time is really hard because they have to cook the sap. So they have to stir it for four to five hours uh, before the sap uh, become uh, granular. So we developed a solution to that. Of course our partner is University of Arizona again in the US. Uh, we went there uh, under, under the mechanical, mechanical engineering department of the University of Arizona. And so we learned the technique also. Uh, we, we could fair our design. And so we were able to fabricate the whole uh, uh, device, the whole system. Uh, from the cooking part, we developed an oven. And it is uh, a biomass because uh, they can use their uh, coconut branches or whatever uh, 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 waste product of the coconuts. They can use it as the source of fire and then we developed a robot arm to steer that one. So uh, the end result is a very nice cuckoo sugar. Now we were just comparing this is what we got 
uh, for my life. Okay? And, uh, um, oops, sorry. So, uh, let me go directly to, uh, I want to show you the, the video of how we're going to cook this. So this is very ideal for us, uh, for our partners here in, in the now. We have lots of uh, coconuts, and the beauty of this is this is by volume. Uh, our 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 uh, machine uh, can be increased to 100 liters uh, per per uh, process. In fact, uh, there's a big difference from five hours of a manual process. We can do it within 45 minutes. 45 minutes to one hour. You can see. Uh, the, the big difference of the process. And then uh, another one is the uh, smart farm. I mentioned to you this one in the uh, media uh, conference. Uh, we have a smart farm for all season to meet the production also. So the idea is uh, we have to control the, the chamber. Rather, we have to develop a chamber. It can be size of 3 square meter or a 3 by 6 square meter and then within that chamber you control the light, you control the irrigation, you control the temperature, you control the soil nutrient and uh, you control the power. Now we're using sustainable energy so we use solar. Uh, so it is part of the funds that I got uh, or the grants that I got to, to have this uh, solar power. And so uh, the problem during this time it keeps on raining. Uh, we cannot sustain the power, of, uh, the solar power. So we have uh, also developed uh, uh, an automated system that it, it detects the amount of power for the solar it is uh, uh, very low. It's shipped to uh, uh, Mirago. So our system is automatic. It can keep on changing, and it follows that. Solar is enough from Meralco to solar. So this optimizes the system. And uh, we use wireless sensor network also. You mentioned about the Internet of Things. Uh, the, 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 the box uh, to open and the, the temperature and the, the, the air conditioning system, these are all uh, communicating each other. So this is a wireless sensor network. And of course, the big thing is the machine vision. Because the machine vision looks at the uh, health of the plant. So uh, you need to know what is the status of the plant. Is it flowering? Is it still on the, uh, 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 what you call that one? Uh, in plant uh, seeds, is it now harvesting? And of course, the uh, lack of nutrients of that. So vision system here again is very important. So we designed our chamber. When we were in Arizona, we used the container van. Alam niyo yung uh, container van, di ba? So they're using that. 
So here in the Philippines, to suit our needs, we use bamboo. So this is our chamber. And then uh, with that, uh, we're able to come up with this. And uh, my researcher is able to uh, come up with or study uh, the growth of tomato. And this is really in, uh, very interesting for them. They are ECE, they are computer science, they are mechanical, they are manufacturing engineering, but they study agriculture. So this is integration. Uh, uh, this is a smart farm where a researcher will know how to plant vegetables and we know how to control technologies also. So this is a fun environment. In fact, uh, every week uh, my students go there and they enjoy uh, playing with these uh, kids and we call it kids. So this is our solar power system. Now, uh, as a part of the uh, irrigation system, it comes from a fish pond. So we, we built a fish pond also. Uh, so the water from this fish pond is the one irrigating plants. So we have to control the uh, uh, NPK. We have to test the water uh, nutrients also. And if it lacks uh, uh, from the fish pond, uh, we can induce uh, another organic fertilizer for this. So these are pure organic farm. <coughs> and then, of course, uh, this is a, a big project we have uh, using Atman uh, uh, robots, uh, flying robots. Okay. Uh, uh, I developed, or my research developed a swarm robotics, uh, where it, uh, it's like bees uh, flying. So we are using drone to do that, and then it evolved. Now uh, these drones can uh, uh, move objects from one place to another. They, they have cooperations. So these are autonomous in nature, uh, and then uh, to give them more fun, these drones also play. <laughs> This is a sample of swarm behavior. Uh, this is equally uh, uh, EPF, uh, a robot from EPFL. Uh, this is from Ecole Polytechnic Federale de Lusan. Uh, this is the uh, bird of swarm robotics algorithm. So you look at those many robots move, moving around, forming uh, the EPL. Uh, uh, later. So, uh, but this one, this is uh, this is a fake. What they did is form the letter first, and then uh, let the robot move around, and they play it backwards in the video. So, but even that this attraction attracts attention to the robot <coughs> robotics researchers. That was a challenge. So another one is this one. It, 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 these robots are more moving around, and then uh, similar to the concept of uh, ants, they can form things. Okay. So this is the the uh, what you call uh, the thing that motivates uh, robotic researchers to develop swarm intelligence. So uh, they realize that this is very important. So we want to copy the behavior of the ants. Ants, for example, really uh, work together without a leader. So uh, robots also can do that. The robots can cooperate. So with that kind of idea, uh, the, the father of the swarm uh, robotics behavior is uh, from Italy, this guy, the Modigo. So they use it then for drones. So we, with that idea, it's better to use many uh, flying robots rather than one to inspect even on disaster area. And uh, uh, the beauty of many robots is if one robot fails, there is still another robot that can come back. Okay? So there is still another flying robot that can come back. So this really inspired, this algorithm really inspires us. And so my lab also uh, built this uh, concept. So uh, with that, uh, let me, we use Inquisify uh, flying robots. Let me 
making sure. This is my lab, by the way. So we can show that one robot can fly with certain point to point. Uh, no, this is automatic. We did not use uh, what we call that one, uh, uh, remote control for this. So this robot can drop, and then that's one, and then two robots. Uh, these two robots will not collide, they have intelligence. They just roam around, flying. Okay. And we can have also three robots, and four, and so on. So uh, you can let them play. Uh, this is inside my lab. Okay. So uh, the algorithm we have, uh, that's the challenge. How do you make algorithms that these robots can make certain behavior? We can move around, okay? And then with that, uh, we want a robot now to come up with a task. So for transport in manufacturing, for example, the robot can carry some load, okay? Like this one, you can see the robot is carrying uh, that basket. And now that that robot is doing on its own, okay? Uh, this one is just tali lang yan para baka mamaksa. Okay? Para malipat ng malayo. But this basket is the one that this robot can carry. And put that one on a specified location. What does the implication of this? If you are in manufacturing plant and you have problems on traversing one area, and if this is very expensive, maybe this is a diamond or a gold, you can let your robot carry the map. Uh, and then, uh, to make it more, we can uh, let the robot to operate, two robots doing together. So we show now that uh, these flying robots can carry heavy objects. In fact, this robot sent command to this that I cannot carry it to the one of Please help me. So this robot now will carry, uh, will help, okay? So that they are communicating each other. This is autonomous, no more human intervention. So they will carry that. Okay? So you see, they, they carry the heavy part. Okay. So, uh, not only two, we can have three robots also. Oops. Sorry. Okay, this one, this way, you can see this is now three robots. We, we put additional load. Okay, this is additional load. So you can see how the robot manipulate and able to lift that bar. Uh, that, 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 that load. There are three of them now. And if you have heavier one, maybe you can make four robots and more robots. Okay, so uh, that's the task. This is a, a flying robots that can do. So going back to this kind of robots, you can use this in the farm. Uh, we can send robots to uh, uh, get video of what happened to your farm, and then uh, report that one. In fact, we have already one client which is interested that uh, a farmer in Mindoro, is a big farm there in Mindoro. He wants to look at what happened to his farm, particularly he said he spent a lot on irrigation and spent a lot on uh, fertilizer. So he wants to monitor that. And uh, sideline is he wants to know if his people there are really working. Okay? So be careful if you are working, we have robots, flying robots that will monitor you. So that's very important. Okay? <laughs> So uh, this is uh, this is the project that I mentioned to you to that uh, uh, remote farm where uh, robot uh, can be used to uh, watch the farm. Not only farm, but even in Australia they use these drones to monitor the cattle. Uh, where does the, the the cattle go or animals go? So you can use these flying robots to to to, to watch uh, and report what happened. Okay, so these are my researchers, my 
family. I call them my sons and daughters. So this is the intelligent systems laboratory of the Minnesota University. And uh, thank you so much for listening. turn over the microphone to the moderator for session two. We have a question here for speakers from session one. No specific name, so you can, any of the speakers can answer this question. So we have Director Tan, Dr. Serafica, Dr. Daniels, and Dr. Riones. Any one of you may answer this question from Anonymous. How do we influence, prepare more at the basic education, particularly public basic education towards achieving fire in terms of skills, competency development, academic skills, lifelong skills? Uh, 
uh, industrial revolution, all aspects, the physical things is involved there. So you have to integrate those things. Let me forward. I just want to show you the competitions. Actually, I call this one Game of Thrones. Okay? This is fun for students. Okay, uh, there's always a competition for drones. Okay, the motion, the flight, the speed. So uh, you have to show to them that they can develop this. You have to you you have to uh, entice them that uh, okay, if you can make it, let's compete. So that's one way of uh, addressing the issue of. Uh, for them to be attracted in that technology. So what we develop here is a okay, game where you can control your drone through your hands. Okay? It's like Harry Potter. Like magic magic your drone will perform. So there is a technology we have, the leap. Uh, and so uh, you put your hands on that gadget and then uh, you communicate that one with your drone and then uh, uh, the right programming, the right communication system, the drone will follow the motion of your hand. Okay? So, uh, this is the concept, uh, game of drones. So, uh, it's an environment, it's an indoor environment. Uh, we have our camera there looking uh, what happened on that environment and then uh, whatever motions of the uh, robot, uh, this is the gadgets that I told you, uh, that one can look at the motion of your hands. Okay? So if you put your hands there, immediately the fingers uh, are scanned right away. So it can have a built-in system that will look and then if you move it right, the system can detect. Uh, uh, so uh, it knows the motion now. So you're going to make a program that can interpret, if I'm going to do that, there's a meaning. If I'm going to do this, there's a meaning. If I'm going to do this, there's a meaning. If I'm going to do this, there's a meaning. So we need to do this, for example, move forward. And then do this move, the drone will fly backward. And then do this, the drone will turn left. Do this, the, the drone will turn right. Uh, I'm sorry, turn left, turn right. So, uh, yeah, look at that. So that hands now is controlling the motion. Okay. So this is the science fiction before uh, the movie of Harry Potter. Okay. Uh, a stick, okay? So, you, you can see the motions of the drone and then goes that hand, it goes backward. So the idea is, uh, based from this communication system, based from that gadget, it communicates, we have a program to our uh, host computer and then this host computer will send command to the drone for appropriate action. So in this case, uh, there are two players. It's like this. Uh, one is addressing for uh, this one. This one, uh, if you want to fire, you open that. Uh, if you want to go left and right or forward, you use this one. So the idea is, this drone will fight and you have the score here. Once uh, they are on the same distance, you can fire. Okay, see? So there's a point here. Okay. And look at the hands also. It keeps on firing that is open. And this one is, if you open, that's a signal that it is firing. So uh, it's fun for the students and you have the score also here. So that's one way of attracting students to study uh, new technologies. Because it's a fun environment. Okay? 
face our soldiers. Uh, we as scientists, as a professional, uh, uh, I mean, we, we solemnly swear to be, uh, uh, we follow professional ethics. But if it is commissioned by right people, by the way, I have a, a new project now approved by, I started by the USD, this is funded by the USD for almost 13 million. This is, we develop a bank disposal robot. So my partner is the EOD United Group uh, under the leadership of uh, uh, Police uh, Superintendent Jonathan Orena. So we, we just started this month. Can we give a hand to Dr. Daniels, please? Thank you. So at this point, may I now turn over the microphone to Dr. Geraldo S. Petilia for the open floor. Thank you. So, how's everyone? Um, I am Hapo Sakanen. <coughs> so, uh, we are privileged and honored to present to you the uh, discussions for this uh, afternoon. And before we do that, please be reminded for the discussions of the rules that you are only given five minutes. And uh, the question and answer will be. Uh, uh, provided to you after the discussions of given their peace. So for our first speaker, uh, Director Glenn Balaguas is a founder and executive director of the Environmental and Climate Change Research Institute at the Nassau University in Alameda and the current representative to the United Nations Convention on Certification. Glenn Malaguas is a multi-awarded prolific research scientist and one of the leading experts on environment, climate change, and disaster risk in the Philippines. He is the recipient of the prestigious Outstanding Young Scientist, or OIS, of the Philippines, of the Philippines conferred by the National Academy of Science and Technology, or NAST. He is awarded the Philippines Men and Women of Science Outstanding Agrofishery Scientific Paper Gold Awardee and the ASEC Outstanding Leadership Award. His work is recognized in the ASEAN Champions for Biodiversity, Environmental Hero Award, and the Asian Professional Award in London, United Kingdom, the name of you. Director Badaguas is an assistant professor, senior research scientist at the De La Salle University and the founder, executive director of the Environmental and Climate Change Research Institute. He handles the climate smart Philippines and he has been in partnership with the Development Academy of the Philippines, MINDA, DAP, Palawan Council for Sustainable Development, and the Harvard Kennedy School and Harvard Club of the Philippines. Glenn studied climate change and energy at Harvard Kennedy School at Harvard University and took sustainability leadership program from Yale University. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Uh, Director Glenn Bananas. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Honest, I don't know what to say. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to give it five minutes. All right, I'll do this fast. I'm just going to orient, what, orient you guys with the things that I do because I'm wearing a lot of hats. Hat, or should I say crowns? Right? I wear a lot of crowns. Well, you mentioned that I'm uh, the founder and executive director of the Environmental Financial Research Institute that I founded in 2010. All right, um, so we do climate modeling. All right, we do climate modeling for rainfall temperature sea surface temperature, and we use global climate models uh, from, uh, from NASA, from the US NOAA, all right, from the NCAR, and different climate model models all around the globe. All right, so we validate them using the big asset data, the one that we have here. And then what we do is we translate things that we do, all right, these technical models, into polar, all right? So we engage 
give and take orders to engage partners, engage uh, academic government agencies, all right? We train them, we capacitate them. Because like what, like what I've been telling to everyone, what is the use of all these models if these particular models are not going to be beneficial to the lives of the people or to the lives of our, of our society? And that's the reason why we always engage stakeholders, people's organization, farmers, fisher folks, indigenous people, on how they're going to use and how they're going to access this particular data for planning and for decision making. That's one hat. My another hat, right? The other hat. Well, I'm also the chair of the ASEAN Science Diplomats. So we train outstanding young scientists in Southeast Asia on how they're going to communicate science to the public. What is the use again of all this technology we have if we are not going to communicate uh, this properly to the people, to the farmers, the fisher folks, and of course the indigenous people? Now, we have the technology, yes, it's good that we have that technology, but if we fail to communicate that to the public, it's useful. <coughs> it's not, it's useless, it's not useful, right? All right, another thing, uh, aside from training this outstanding young scientists of Southeast Asia, to communicate science to the public. What we also do here is to train them on how to develop projects, proposals, all right, that can be submitted to USAID, to ADB, to World Bank, or to JET, uh, Global Environmental Facility, Global uh, Green Climate Fund, and so on and so forth. So these outstanding scientists of Southeast Asia are trained not only to communicate science, but of course, to develop science-based proposals. Another fact, the second fact. The third fact, Okay, as the country representative of the United Nations um, Convention to uh, Convention to Combat Certification, now we are doing this particular project all over the Philippines, and we were able to identify river bases in the Philippines. One in Luzon, one in Visayas, and four river bases in Mindanao. In Mindanao, as I'm here in Mindanao, one is actually um, the Davao River Basin, the other one is Tagum de Bugana River Basin. Number three, we have the Mindanao River Basin. Number four, the, the Tagum, the, the Tagulawan. Is that correct? It's Tagulawan. Right? They, they taught me how to pronounce it perfectly. It's Tagulawan River Basin, of course, the, the Tagulawan River Basin. So what is the purpose of this particular project? This particular project is in collaboration with the Department of Agriculture, uh, the SWR, the Bureau of Social and Water Management, and different cash agencies, and even the Department of Natural Environment and Natural Resources. This is in uh, support with support of UNCCD, where I am representing, and of course the UNDP, the United Nations Development Program. So, what is this particular project all about? Um, this is about the land division mentality. We call it No Words Till the End. Land division mentality. It has never been done in the Philippines. It has never been done in Southeast Asia. And what we want to achieve here is we want to be the first, not only in the Philippines, but of course in Southeast Asia. In LDN, you are considering different parameters. We're doing the biodiversity conservation, the food production system. We're also doing the sustainable forest management. And we are also doing the sustainable land management. All these three particular parameters in order to attain land division mentality. All right? Okay, now that's number three. Number four. <laughs> now, as so if you ask the CIT of our science and technology, we engage with the different government agencies on how to on uh, how to help them to develop science-based policy policies. All right. So, like what I did, uh, so you have the fellow, we I was assigned at the Climate Change Commission and the Department of Energy, and we did a people survival fund (PSF). How this PSF is going to be? Mainstream and how this particular people's survival fund can be accessed with the local government units and with accredited local community organizations. So we developed a right the framework that I, that, that I discussed uh, during the press one, the three framework, the track, and the state policy model. These particular components have to be integrated into the proposal so that this particular proposal will be a right will be accepted will be approved by the panel, the national panel of technical experts, all right. Uh, um, a science-based proposal, a climate change adaptation proposal. Then, that's it. Time is up. Okay. Time is up. That's all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Director Balagwas. Due to the interest of time, so we are strictly enforcing the time limit, so apologies for that. Okay, so our next speaker is uh, 
a convener and promotion event and sustainable for organization in the art. Uh, we have Edgar Wood-Gesser. He started his career as an accountant when he was fresh, graduated from 1975, and joined the prestigious firm SGP. Among the different projects that he had studied, it was agriculture and the remote countryside itself that attracted the most, thus giving him the choice join the Mokito-based Young Pioneer in February 1977. Uh, he is also the lead convener of the promotion of investments of sustainability in ARN, a grouping of corporate investors in the Muslim autonomous region. He has no doubt that sincerely given a difficult chance to do so, but some more can develop economically and help in everyone's aspiration for lasting peace in Indiana. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our next, next speaker. We have Mr. Ed Munizel. Sir. Good morning, Mr. Lama, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. Just uh, a quick recap, as uh, our moderator says, in the rest of time. Uh, all the presentations clearly are triggered by the passion, the commitment, love of doing it. Uh, but everything uh, technology-based, trying to catch up with the rest of the world. Uh, just some specifics in the case of Ms. Kersal. Um, really, it's very interesting and it's like very surprising what uh, sharp oil, 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 and stuff that I own. And it's a joke, maybe we can tell China if you do not behave or the South China Sea will export typhoon to you. We can start with typhoon if maybe we can make typhoon, but that's just a joke anyway. Uh, for engineering area on a small scale fishing boats, um, <clears throat> it is the wrong piloting, uh, database also, uh, very uh, big specifics, and we just have to see it already actually being implemented uh, operationally. Uh, same with General Alex or NISA and Dr. Elmer. Um, these are all down to reality. Are we doing it already? What is the cost of doing it? If not yet, uh, a fellow colleague in the business sector, Mr. Gaisano, will be more than happy, I think, to see how can this benefit my business. Uh, we saw the catch all illustration, you know. Uh, it's amazing that car by car, the plate number can be captured. Or maybe in the case of Mr. Gaisano, in his mall, face by face of those who enter, already enters into a database, follow that guy, he looks suspicious, no offense to any of those people entering his mall. But again, it is um, conventions or gathering like this that we can, that becomes a, a, a marketplace of ideas and it inspires us. Many will take notes. We have, uh, Japanese friend there, Mr. Sumikawa, taking notes and maybe this people we will contact because he also would like to benefit from this. That's all. Thank you very much, and this our presenter. Okay, we're down to our last discussion. Our last discussion, just like the previous discussion that we have, is also a member of the National Research Council in the Philippines. Dr. Emmanuel Pacheco Diario is a full professor of biology and presently chair of the Department of Biology, College of Arts and Sciences at the Central Mindanao University in Bukidon, where he is affiliated for the past 23 years, 28 years rather. He received his BS Biology in 1990 and MS in Biology uh, at the CMU and currently pursuing his PhD in Biology uh, systematics in the same institution. Aside from being the chair of the Department of Biology at the CMU, Dr. Diario is also the Mindanao Master Head of the National Research Council of the Philippines. It is my honor to present to you our third discussion, Dr. Manuel Diario. Good afternoon, everyone. Agri-industrial technology is concerned about the application of science and technology. The papers that we have heard for this second session or this show a series of examples 
of agricultural and industrial applications and how these technologies could improve the agro-industrial sector. These promising technologies could be further perfected and these agro-industrial technologies are expected to increase in the years to come. As we again reiterate, drones are used to monitor farm plants, particularly hilly areas, application of fertilizers, monitoring the status of transmission lines, which are very difficult to do. Huh? The soil fertility testing device is a breakthrough. This could modernize the determination of NPK, quality, and pH of soil samples. This promising device, used directly in the field, could be further tested for its precision and accuracy, and this could be applied for a European model, a found model, a Filipino patent is encouraged. The implementation of prototype or geolocation of the poles of the fishermen with emergency communication is a very welcoming development. Increasing the transmission of emergency signals beyond 5.4 kilometers as being claimed is a challenge for Professor Minillas and her uh, team. Uh, furthermore, I believe with the Pinoy talent and hoping one day that we can create our very own microcontroller aside from the most common Arduino microcontroller that we use. This is all we have to So we're done with our discussions. Now it's time for us to have our question and answer portion. Uh, I hope you have prepared your questions. And before that, may I request the uh, four uh, previous presenters to please come forward and take a seat here with our sofa. We have Ms. Persad, uh, Dr. Medios, of course, uh, Engineer Alex, and Ms. Miriam. For those questions uh, that are directed to the uh, discussants, uh, the audience may feel like to present or raise the uh, question to them. Uh, by the way, uh, I'm going to read the questions that, are, that were submitted to us. Uh, and after that, if there are still time, we can allow probably two or three questions uh, to the floor for those who would like to uh, ask questions to any of the uh, guests that we have. Please uh, state your name and then your questions to uh, where you want to uh, place your questions to any of these uh, uh, guests that we have. But before that, I guess uh, our first question is uh, directed to Ms. Lia. Is she in the room right now? Uh, so, since we don't we have, we are going to wait for Ms. Lia to come, I'd like to open the floor to the uh, participants, our academics, and other guests who are here. Please feel free to, make, to use the microphones there on your left and your right. If you have questions, our discussants and presenters are ready to answer your questions. Anyone? Since uh, there's no question yet, we probably are going to raise my own question at this point. Ah, yes. Ah, okay. Thank you. To whom do you invest your question, please? Hello. 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 So when we 
care about the banan, lahat tayo ay Pilipino. So, parang, parang, as a family, pag naglokohan, halimbawa, kami mga Muslim, na nandiyan po si Lui, tapos, pinapadalan yung mga sundalo niya. So, may pagbakan, patayan, ng mga patayan. So, instead of sending those precious lives to the hinterland to suppress like sabi nga nila yung mga wild wild creatures okay forgive me about the term so sir would you like to suggest a scientist and as, as an inventor as an innovator just a part of promoting promoting peace Instead of sending those men, why just we send the drones in order to to monitor? That's what I mean. Okay. Okay. Uh, we scientists uh, have uh, promise to do and to invent technology for humanity. It's not to distract humanity. So, if you're talking of uh, a robot that can invade uh, personal privacy that's against professional ethics. So, uh, you need to pass so much uh, rigorous uh, ethical review before you can Submit that kind of research. Now, if in the event it will pass professional ethics, uh, we as the inventor has to judge the right thing. Okay? That is why we are more superior than robots because human's intelligence has the capability to decide what is right and wrong. So that will be the case. Now, uh, if you're talking of just merely getting data, you're just saying that looking the scenario, what is going in, I think that's all right. Okay? Uh, for as long as you don't hit or you don't uh, 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 purposely bump or you don't purposely do uh, atrocities to those people, right? In fact, they are still humans. Uh, we can, uh, I mean, uh, we, we do this for humanity. So if you just uh, fly something there, just look at maybe they are playing, maybe they are doing things, and report that one, that's okay. What is happening in adventure is to avoid destruction. So instead of sending man, why don't we just send the drones that in order to protect the lives of everyone. Yeah. So to monitor the inhabitants in the local. As I mentioned, if it is just to monitor, not to kill them, because that's number one, uh, uh, building the robots do not harm humanity. So that's, uh, that's the ethics that we have to follow. Okay. Greater progress of this country, yes. Okay, maraming salamat po. Uh, do we have other questions? Yes, uh, you can use the mic here. Can you state your name, your institution, and to whom you will address the question? Thank you. Um, Francis Pates, Menico, University of Science and Technology in Southern Philippines. So we would like to thank our presenters for presenting to us your innovations, knowledge, products, and technologies that hopefully will help um, develop new now. So um, I would like to direct the question for, to our organizers in the now development authority and also to National Research Council of the Philippines. Uh, we've heard today about uh, research for development. So they, they were able to come up with researches that hopefully will be translated into the development, especially for Mindanao. So first for Mindanao Development Authority for, I don't know, here, yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, after having this, is there any any program 
of Minda for knowledge translation. Let's say these are the these, these are these are the products of the academy. So what's next? How can the farmers feel like the benefit of what uh, Sir Alex presented to us? And it's really true. One time we went to Claveria, sir, and then along the way we saw these tomatoes along the road. So we we asked the uh, owner of the house, "Ma'am, can we buy some of your tomatoes?" Said, "No, just get it." It's for free and even squash. And these are like uh, sweat and blood of the farmers. And they cannot send. I, I really agree. So meaning to say that technology that they were able to develop must be felt, must be, must benefit the people. So what can Minda do? And maybe I'm a member of National Research Council of the Philippines. So uh, I remember before uh, there was a funding by NRCP with Capital University and Safety University, and we came up with a database of all the researchers in Mindanao. But I think we should level up. After having this database, maybe we can fund researchers, like how many of these studies developed were translated into industry application, or maybe improved our curriculum later? Uh, that's for Minda and NRCP. All right, thank you so much, Ron. So maybe we can ask uh, Director Raytan to please answer the question, and probably Dr. Kassan will answer on behalf of NRC. Thank you, Madam. I, this, this response was supposed to be part of the closing statement, but what we would like to highlight is that MINDA, in partnership with the IPS and soon with uh, NRCP, together with the other member higher education institutions, or what we call the MINDA Namnali Center, 10% of the 430 are members. And then, we collaborate in that context, meaning, Binda will be shepherding or leading as a leader so that the disconnect between the what were produced as technology in terms of application to the app. Together with that, with agriculture. Like, for example, we have this uh, case where there is increased productivity in a particular remote area. But the problem is the road or access to market. This is where the road is, the roads liberating because of industry and trade of DPI and DPWA itself connect the farmers towards the market and bring their goods to the market. But it is more application that something that we have to closely connect with the other appropriate government needs. So as the kind of thinking providing the environment where this will happen. Dr. Rizal, thank you sir for that question. I have an uh, one of the possible outcomes of this, uh, of this forum is for uh, Minda and its partners to come up with policy statements that can influence uh, legislators to come up with uh, bills or laws that can help promote the uh, outputs of research. And in relation to the uh, activities of the NRCP in Minnao, uh, as I mentioned this morning, we are a new partner of uh, MINDA and we're hoping that, that through the number of uh, researchers that, that are in MINDA now, like you, we can come up with uh, studies that can help promote the quality of life of farmers in MINDA now. And you mentioned about the uh, compilation of uh, research projects. From what I know is that uh, none has been done, but what we have done was to initiate the formulation of a culture and heritage agenda for Mindanao, so that all these activities that we are doing to uh, promote Mindanao can also take into account uh, culture. We don't want the people of Mindanao to lose their culture as we introduce new technologies to them. So we're hoping that uh, we can move forward with the culture and heritage agenda so that we can take into account the rich culture of uh, Mindanao as we introduce uh, various technologies, various research outputs that are designed to improve the lot of uh, the Mindanaoans. Thank you. 
need a discharge. No, I'm sorry. We're back. Sorry, we left. It's in the bottom of the bottom. It's in the bottom of the bottom. Anyway, yeah, let's see. Okay, uh, just, just to give you uh, just a very quick answer. Uh, Minda uh, and Sarah I and other, like the Harvard Medical School, Alumni Association of the Philippines, we have been providing training, capacity building to the local government units, to the education sector, all right, the education state sector, we call it the TOT training of trainers. And what is that kind of training or capacity building is all about? This is about how our local government units and local community organizations to come up with a science-based projects, all right, that will benefit our partners, teacher folks, and of course, the IEPs. So we did a lot of trainings. We did around 40 municipalities, right? Okay. And then uh, a major river basin here, river basin here in Mindanao. So the training, uh, if you ask all them, that these are non-scientists. Promise, if you attend one of our trainings, we'll tell you even the non-scientists can benefit to uh, the training that we provide. They are learning. So it's not only limited to the LGUs, it's not only limited to the local community organizations. We also train the education sector. And during the TOTs that we conducted last year, there were about 20 to 30 universities, SUCs, HEIs that attended that training. Thank you very much. Thank you, Director. Uh, Glenn. Since uh, Ms. Lydia is already in the room, we will request her to take her seat. There's a, there's a question for you here. Maybe you haven't encountered this in the, this world, but there's a question here. And this universe, that's you can try this one. This question is for Ms. Ria Kersad. The question goes like this. You mentioned about testing your technology at uh, stopping the typo in Middle When do you plan to conduct this? If it entails spending something in the ocean, have you sought necessary permit or legal procedure for the conduct of your study? And question number two, this is for the finance. Why did you decide to test it in Mindanao waters, which historically is not frequented by typhoons, unlike northern Philippines, such as Batanes, Cagayan, and in Visayas, Tacloban, and Samar? We are right now in the process of securing the permits and any type of uh, legal paperwork and the things that we need. So that's actively in progress right now. And because of the timing of this, it's so interesting that in scientific literature, you find that they say, the typhoons are hitting more north. Most of the literature out there goes up till 2013, the year 2013, right? So I would say 90% of the scientific information out there actually goes up to the year 2013. Since the year 2013 to the year 2018, we have seen a shift in the climate patterns, and we're just beginning to see that. And so, the reason for Mindanao, what we're thinking, is it also bears to reason that in the last five years we have seen more of the types of rainfall, storms, these kinds of things actually later in the season. And so that's also another kind of uh, research that we're doing, which is to see what are these new patterns that we're seeing emerge in southern Philippines and how are these patterns moving in their geography? So that's why we're more focused here because it's been traditional, right? Norm, everybody knows that, but things are changing. So we want to study how things are changing here. And so we're looking toward the very end of this kind of wet season, which is where, which is usually when we would be hardest hit lately to conduct this, pending, of course, all of the proper permits and things coming through. All right, thank you so much for that answer. 
Do we have other questions uh, before? Yes. yes. I was waiting for you, Ms. Rita. In the 1990s, I read a book, It's a Matter of Survival by Anita Gordon and David Suzuki. And they said, you were saying a while ago that 30 years after, there will be no more islands in the Philippines. So, like, my memories uh, went back to those years, 1990, when we were studying that book. It was our text for one week in a, in a master, master's course in UP that spans society and environment. And it's a sea level will rise by nine meters in 2050. So, I live in Ebonia Beach along the coast. And since then, I was watching the sea level, and it's already at my doorstep. I was thinking at the time when I read the book, okay, I'll be dead by then. No, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, I almost lost my family when there was a typhoon. And then my four million house of my cousin, who is now in the States, he stayed there for only one week, and then the house was gone. And many of my family's houses were also gone. So then I remember the book. You were saying projections, and they're making projections in that book. Like, wow, it's true. Another thing, you were saying that your professor told you at the time, you can make a typhoon. Okay, many years ago, it's not even a conference like this. It was a, like a closed door conference by scientists, and it was privileged to be there. And they said, you know the power of the US. They can say, Let's bring La Nina to the Philippines. <laughs> like I was, I was saying it's crazy. Sometimes too much intelligence can be like many of the scientists that you're studying, I think Mount Poliara is there, the founders of sociology, all of them I think went through the uh, moments in their life that they have to leave the university because they went crazy for a while. So I know here you are waking up those like, oh, it's crazy. But I'm not saying, that you are the why we have sent on here is because of the US. But it's possible. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I am open to crazy ideas. <laughs> so the question is, you know when the send on happened, I lost my brother in law. And because of that, so it now becomes personal. It's not just like, oh I'm a professor here. So I'm an instructor here, not yet a professor. Uh, and and I, I want to make a difference. It's now more on like it's a personal mission, just like you coming over here despite the typhoon warning. Because we care. And I think that's the bottom line of research. Because we care. So, the thing is, uh, okay, going back to the mayor when Sendo happened, and then many lost their properties, their families. You cannot imagine, and these are my friends. They were crazy. They cannot, they cannot uh, take in the memories that they have. Our mayor faced, at that time, a lot of cases. It, the previous mayor, not the mayor that we saw today. So then the, there's policy making. Like, okay, you're here, but then again, we need policy makers to hear this and come up with policies and implement the policies. When I first came here, like, do we still need policy? Didn't we have good policies and even other countries copied our policy? And many literature would say we have very good policies, but the implementation is not effective. So then, like leaving this forum, I, I want an assurance, and maybe on your part, like you will not be studying or designing something, innovating for nothing, but it's really saving humanity, and this is a serious thing. Like that's why you visit my house, 20 years married, it's never finished, and no plan. To finish, I was thinking like I'm going to settle in the upland. But you just said these islands will become, and maybe there's a crazy idea that will become reality in the future. So it's more on like where do we go from here? It's a song. Thank you. Yeah, it's nice. it's yes. Thank you very much for your comments, Mana. We I really appreciate listening to your perspective and also hearing about your uh, genuine concern as well. I think it's very important for us to share on that. And just to very uh, succinctly answer, where do we go from here? I think that this 
forum, among many other things, helps us to raise awareness of what issues belie us. And in having that knowledge, we are in a position now to say, okay, what is my community, what am I going to do? And in our community, what are we going to do to adapt? And I think that the key for us on a day-to-day -day and a practical level is that adaptation to the situation. And you know, climate change does not have to be a disaster unless if it becomes a danger to the people. But if we prepare ourselves and if we adapt, then it's not a disaster. It's not a disaster. You understand? So what we're trying to do really is to reduce the disaster. And that's what we can do here today. Okay, so we're done. Do we, I think we can have see one more question before we go. Uh, is there any question or comment on the floor? Anyone? Ah, yes. Please, uh, you have your right here. Dr. Luce Escalon from Mindanao Energy Systems Incorporated, a practicing human resource, resource practitioner. I have a question for Dr. Daniels. Hi, sir. I'm very amazed with your presentation on robotics and mechatronics. I have two questions. The first question is, having heard all the researches and innovations that you have made, we'd like to know how soon we will be able to uh, get access to your inventions and if this would be given at a reasonable cost because I think all of those inventions that you have made are very practical and very useful to us all here. Number two, being in the uh, HR profession where we are always taught that the human resource is the most important resource, we would like to know if these inventions would now result to us losing jobs. There would be no more people because all of it will now be unprovided. Uh, thank you very much for that question. For question number one, as I mentioned, uh, the the uh, uh, the mango sorbet is already on the market. It's available. The the capsule also uh, it's part up already. So uh, it's. Uh, uh, in, in place, so this will be implemented maybe in months from now. And then the the drones, uh, it's not yet commercially uh, uh, done, but it can be deployed in time. Somebody, some businessman, uh, wanted uh, to to avail of that. And uh, the other things, uh, we have lots uh, of in place now. Uh, as I mentioned, we, we develop any kind of robots. In fact, uh, one of our uh, robot is uh, used for textile industry. Uh, uh, if you notice our barong now, it's not yet uh, embroidered, it's painted. So, uh, one of the garments uh, in Manila is uh, asking us to do that by uh, robot, uh, the one that we paint. So, uh, that is easy. So to answer, yes, it is available now. The second one, uh, regarding the uh, loss of the job. Well, as uh, the very uh, energetic uh, president of ADS, she said already that uh, there's a job that will be lost, but there's another job that will be created. So uh, for those who lo uh, we lost for a job, triple of that will be created new jobs. Uh, I, I, I see this one in the same hearing which I attended all, all the day. Because we are afraid that the call centers will be affected of this uh, uh, automation system. But uh, uh, it is always a fact 
that uh, the technologies that was disrupted will be replaced by a very better technology. So, as I mentioned, we need to prepare our people. And so, uh, preparing our people starts from the institutions, starts from us, starts from the government. It's not only the government. And definitely, there are stakeholders. It's, I suppose, I, ha I have shown to you uh, this morning, but I have no more time and I have no power. It was there, uh, the, the role of the stakeholders. It's a, it's a life cycle. Okay. Uh, the the government agencies like uh, the USD, like the uh, TESNA, like uh, the CHED, and uh, of course the the, the uh, Congress, they are they should have a holistic approach for this. So the we need to come up with an agency, an uh, interagency uh, process that runs fast. I will cite you one. Uh, for example, in the no contact apprehension, how can we penalize the violator? Okay. How can we take money from the violator? Right now, I mean, they collect money right away. But if it is no contact apprehension, you cannot collect money because uh, you do away with those uh, middlemen. So we need to talk with the LTO. Uh, because they are the one registering the cars. So if you want to penalize similar to a road, then uh, the car owners who register that one should pay. And so uh, it is easy for us to make programs on that for as long as they will give access uh, to the registered owners. But we have a data privacy act. We cannot access that. So in other words, that's the thing that uh, make hindrance to the system. Uh, to implement that, how can we punish the uh, violators? Uh, uh, we cannot collect money from them right away. So uh, the interagency's government is to look into that. Okay. Okay. All right. We're done with our second session. We are formally closing our second session, and we would like to thank our presenters and our discussants. Thank you so much for the uh, uh, participants for asking questions. I'll